Thank you so much, and thanks everybody for being here. I'm really excited to talk to Dan. Um, his story, as we were just discussing, was one that has captured the world's attention. Um, so I'm really interested to hear what a couple of months it's been and where the idea came from. And I would like to leave plenty of time at the end for questions, so please um, you know, be ready, because that's part of the point of this whole festival. So all that said, Dan, um, I want to actually start slightly unconventionally. Could you just tell us what Gravity Payments does? Yeah, so basically, when you use your credit card, it's really easy for you because we credit card processors, we move the money, and we keep your data secure. But it's actually a huge pain in the rear end for the business that's accepting your card. They get overcharged. It's very unfair for them. It's very opaque. And the service is really, really bad. And so I recognized that uh, pretty early on and wanted to change that. And so we basically provide that in a, in a service that's much more fair to that business. So you're 31 years old, correct? Correct. And you had this idea 14 years ago? Yeah. Uh, it actually came out uh, of, I, I was in a rock band actually growing up. And I started a band when I was 12. And um, we were quite successful. We had a big show, uh, seventh grade year. And I'm not joking. And our favorite local band actually was there and asked us to go on tour with them. And we said, well, we can't drive. <laughs> was this all in Idaho? Yeah. Wow. And they said, that's OK. You guys can pay for gas. And anyway, the, the, the band really did well and succeeded. And you know, a year later, we were uh, being played on the radio locally. And then a year later, we're being played on the radio nationwide. We play our largest show for 5,000 people. And then at 16, when the band broke up, What I was the name of the band? Straightforward. OK. I had all these. Uh, business relationships, and I started to do, to do procurement for these businesses. And to Did you know the word procurement then? No, definitely not. Because <laughs> I'm not sure I know what it means now. Well, I definitely didn't know what like entrepreneur meant. I didn't know what venture capital was or any of those fancy words. Right. Um, but I just saw in that role that it was so unfair for these businesses. And uh, independent businesses, they make our lives so rich. If you think about your favorite street, any town in the United States, look around, imagine yourself there, and it's all these independent businesses that make it so great. And so for me, even if it's a small thing, seeing these independent businesses being taken advantage of. In uh, what way? How are they being taken advantage of? You know, a lot of opaque fees. It's similar to um, you know, maybe some of the uh, cable or utility mm -hmm. companies that some of us are used to, where the fees go up, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to understand. Um, but in credit card processing, it's even way worse. So it's hard to understand. There are a lot of hidden fees. And then, um, you know, their system would go down. No one was there to take care of them. And so I, I was basically their kind of part-time employee to help them manage this. And then uh, a lot of them said, Dan, why don't you build a company to do this, which was a little bit crazy. So were you kind of negotiating with Visa and MasterCard, or was it more like the the little payment source itself, those companies? It was iterative. First, I was negotiating on behalf of my clients with the credit card processors, like similar to what I do now. And then I just started going up and up the value chain and trying to control more because my, my big, big goal was just to make credit card processing fair for these independent businesses. And uh, unfortunately, those in my industry didn't share that goal. So I had to basically do everything to make it work. And so for the last 12 years, you've been building this business, expanding it, doing quite well. Um, but the reason why I was asking a little bit about the background is the first time I heard of Gravity Payments, a couple of months ago, big headline comes out, CEO to give his workers um, a minimum wage of $70,000. And immediately, just because I'm a little bit cynical, I think, oh, well, this can't be a legitimate company or... You know, this guy must really just be in it for some kind of like Do you want me to attention. go in the other room? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, cause, but you can understand that, right? Because yeah, like, if kidding. you read that headline, you'd probably think the same thing. Yeah. And um, the great thing about Dan and being able to learn a little bit more um, and follow along with your story is that this sounds totally legitimate and kind of normal in a weird way. So what was it that, let, that led you to all of a sudden decide to make this huge move uh, which is going to affect you personally and your company um, in such a big way? Well, when I was building the business, my first person that I ever hired, um, his name's David, and I was able to pay him $24,000 a year and no health benefits. That was, my, that was what I was able to offer. And I felt horrible about that, but it was legitimately the most I could afford, and it was like either I do this or I don't have anyone. So I paid him that, and I decided 
I'm going to try to make this a world-class learning opportunity for David and try to really help him in his career because in a way I'm kind of shorting him. I'm kind of ripping him off with this compensation package. And I grew the company kind of like that and so we'd get to maybe like three or four thousand in profit and then we'd hire somebody who would go to zero. And we get to three or four thousand, we'd hire someone, we'd go to zero. <laughs> and it just seemed like paradise. And I remember when I made thirty thousand dollars a year after three years of doing that, I felt like I was a millionaire. <laughs> like this is so cool because I'm achieving my dream, I'm helping these businesses, and I don't have to live in an unfinished utility closet mm -hmm. anymore, which is actually what I did for those first few years. <laughs> well, anyway, um, it seemed to work okay until 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of not having enough profit and enough savings, we actually almost lost the business three times wow. between 2008 and 2009. So in 2008 and 2009, I got really disciplined financially, and I got really focused on making a profit. 2011 rolls around, and we're actually more, successfully, more successful financially than we've ever been. Wow. Um, but I was out in the parking lot coming back from, the, from a meeting, and I, I noticed there was uh, one of my colleagues that was actually taking a smoke break in the parking lot. And do you ever get the feeling like somebody just hates you and you're not sure why? <laughs> well, I had that feeling about this gentleman, also still works for the company, Jason, that he was really, really pissed at me. And so I went to Jason, and I said, Jason, you know, can you tell me what's going on yeah. here? And he, he said, Dan, you're so proud about how profitable we are and how frugal you are and you're a savvy business person, but the way you're paying me, you're actually doing that on my back and you're taking it out of my paycheck, what belongs to me. And of course, I go into corporate CEO mode and all the stuff that people are saying now about me, which is, well, I'm doing it based on competitive market analysis mm -hmm. and I'm looking at your job and we could agree to disagree, but these are my sources. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't really care about any of that stuff. I just know, and you know that you're doing this. I said, Jason, do you think I'm doing this on purpose? Mm -hmm. He said, absolutely. I think you are intentionally ripping me off. I kind of wanted to go into a, like crawl into my bed for three days and just cry. What was he making, if, if I can ask? Yeah, he was making uh, low to mid $30,000 a year. In, what, in Seattle? In Seattle. Okay. And so, doing what kind of role? How senior was he? He was, um, he was front line accepting phone calls for client you know, issues, people that, that maybe their credit card machine had been down and it wasn't working. So, and if he weren't in that role, could you fill it relatively quickly? Very quickly. Okay. Yeah. And that was part of the problem, right? So I thought about it for three days and after getting over convincing myself that I was a total victim <laughs> and no one appreciated me, <laughs> I actually decided that I was wrong and Jason was right, not only about the technical parts of the market, but also my intention. Hmm. And it was a, How a, much were you making at this time, if I can ask? Probably 50,000 a year. Okay, not, Is that, was that about the most you had made? Most I'd ever made in, in my year? life. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, understanding that actually my intention was in the wrong place was a super painful process for me to go, go through. And uh, this was maybe October, November. So I set a goal immediately for the following year, 2012, mm -hmm. that we were going to average a 15% annual raise. And they did a very small, like a $1 or $2 across the board increase right away, which is the absolute most we could afford at the time. <laughs> but what I said to everybody is, hey, look, everybody, we need to keep this margin of safety in our business. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to average a 15% annual raise, our productivity needs to go up by 20 or 25% mm -hmm. to make that work. So everyone got on board, and we did that for the next three years. Wow. And it created a situation where people that had been there for a while were doing quite well. But anyone that was just starting out, getting started in their career, it was taking them three, four, five years of basically living in poverty. I mean, we should just call it what it is, living very, very close to poverty. But an experience that at least both of us personally have also been through. Correct. At the start of our careers. Correct. But I asked myself, OK, I, I believe in, uh, I think about, and I'm conscious of mortality, right? And so these three to five years are valuable. It's important to struggle. But also, you only get to live once. And so why not live the best life possible? So I started to think about that. And I started to realize that many of them were working really hard, just as hard as me. And different than back then when I was making a, a reasonable income, my salary at this point had been set by compensation consultants hmm. who had said it, what would we need to replace Dan as CEO if something mm -hmm. happened to Dan? 
So I was making over a million dollars. And Jason at the time was doing better, but the new Jason, you know, somebody else mm -hmm. in that position wasn't. And to me, seeing the disparity between what I was making and the struggle they were living every day, it just didn't make sense to me. So this was percolating, uh, this sense, first of all, the conversation with him, some of the moves you had already made. And what I love about this, just from like a CNBC point of view, is it also tells me quite clearly the economy in the background was improving. Yeah. Because this is a, such a different story than it would have been the case in 2007, 2008. And it sounds like you had to rebuild your financial buffer and kind of be more productive and run more efficiently. But having checked all of those boxes, then you approach this year when you read uh, about the benefits, or about happiness, we should say. There was a study that came out that basically said people's happiness tends to increase with their income to a level of about $70,000 and then levels off. And you read that and thought what? You know, the actual technical language was that your well-being, your emotional well-being, and which they use the word happiness loosely, but if you actually read it, it also says the, the opposite, which is for every dollar that you make under that number, mm. your emotional well-being is actually being hurt. Mm. So I went on a hike with a good friend, and she doesn't work at Gravity, mm -hmm. but she was having a very small rent increase and trying to figure out, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to pencil it out? This is somebody that works really hard, served in the military for 11 years, wow. very, very smart, very experienced, and she can't quite pencil out a mm. basic lifestyle in Seattle. And I realized that folks that work for me were in that same situation. And the thing that was different about this time compared to last time I was at this type of a crossroads was I could actually do something about it. And in hindsight, I've seen that with that study and some of the other resources that I've seen, I actually think that being healthy mm -hmm. allows you to perform better. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get a good night's sleep, when you eat well, when you mm -hmm. exercise, you perform better in your job. But, and, it's, but it's funny because we're seeing companies recognize that and say, okay, great, well, we're going to improve the offerings at our cafeteria and sure, you can like log in from home one day a week if you need to or something. Right, but if your emotional well-being is literally being harmed by not being paid enough, and you take away that harm, I think that we're gonna see that performance improves. Now, we're kind of an underdog with that. We're kind of flying in the face of a lot of <laughs> economists, what people believe, and so we have to go out there and prove it. And we're cognizant of that. And it's only 10 weeks ago. So we That's really don't know ask. how it's going to turn out yet. So 10 weeks ago, people who might have been making twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 suddenly saw their paycheck increase to an annualized amount of 70000 Correct. About a third of the folks that work at Gravity had their pay doubled or more. Wow. So it was a big day. It was really exciting for us. And where did the money come from? So um, I took my pay temporarily from a little bit over a million dollars down to $70,000. Mm. So that covered um, a little less than half of it. Hmm. And then our profit last year was $2.2 million. Mm -hmm. This program is going to cost about $2 million. A year? A year. Okay. And so it's basically going to take our profit down to zero with a little bit of savings, and I'm going to buffer that profit by not taking my normal paycheck. And hopefully we can make this all work and get back to a place where we're actually higher with higher profitability than what we had last year. Here's where it's really important to note that Gravity Payments is not a publicly traded company. You know, it is and it isn't because people say that and a lot of folks are like, well, you know, could you do this if you had investors? Could you do, do this if you were publicly traded? And I actually have seen a lot of examples of, of publicly traded companies that have conviction and act with conviction. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they really perform well. They get better respect, but, but have they done it in this way? Well, and that's the problem. For some reason, we believe it's okay to invest in software, in product, mm -hmm. in capital expenditures. And we all say that people are our most important mm -hmm. asset. Yet, as soon as somebody actually takes action, mm -hmm. showing that they believe that people are our most important asset, um, you know, everybody seems to think it's weird. Mm -hmm. And I, I would love to see if another company that was publicly traded did this, what their shares would do that day. Because mm -hmm. it's a really interesting thought experiment, because I don't think we'll see it in the real world. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people will see in a couple of years what you've done and be inspired. But you could imagine the investor suddenly going, wait a minute. So I'm going, because if you're investing in a stock, that's you're investing in future cash flows of the company. So I'm going, so you're telling me you're going from cash flows of $2.2 million down to 200000 and that I'm just supposed to trust that this is going to work out for the next couple of years? Well, one thing that is actually a little counterintuitive, and there's been a few different studies and, and uh, statistical analyses that show this, 
Companies that are purpose-oriented, mm -hmm. that have something on their minds and hearts other than making money, actually make more money over the long term mm -hmm. than companies that are more financially driven. And so in the short term, I think profits can go down sometimes when you make these types of decisions. And, but ironically, in the long term, I actually think companies are more successful. That's kind of my justification for doing it. That's not the reason why I do it. Um, the reason would be, is the reason truly just altruistic? You know, I would, I would be a little bit more specific than that. So for me, my 40-year goal, which I articulated for the first time five years ago, mm -hmm. was to be a part of a movement, maybe even a revolution, where we start to have a scorecard other than just making money. We start to think about what's the purpose of our lives and how are we going to fulfill that at work. And actually, we measure ourselves based on the impact we have on others. And that's kind of a high and lofty thing. And no, I'm just chuckling because the study that kicked this all off was actually $70,000 really does matter. Right. But it, it's a high and lofty goal that I have on the one side. On the other side, day to day, I have to make sure that anybody that trusts us to do their credit card processing, any business out there, gets the best service, the best price, has all the products they want, and that we're helping them engage with their customer and grow their business. And you can look at these two goals that I have and say, wow, this one is very practical, and this one is very theoretical, and how are they connected? But for me, one of the great pleasures in my life is every day trying to bring these two closer together and seeing them as the same thing. And what I really want to inspire other people to do is not just, I mean, if somebody says, I also want to do a $70,000 minimum wage, I'd be really excited. What about an $80,000 one? I'd be even more excited. <laughs> However, what I really, really want to inspire people to do is to understand what's that thing? For me, my 40-year goal is something I'd be willing to give up everything else in my career to achieve. And if I just achieve this one thing, I can check the box that I, that I had a good professional life and I'm ready to retire. And I think everybody probably has one thing deep down. They might not have articulated it yet. And if you can connect that one thing to what you're doing every day at work, I think it takes away a lot of pressure and it allows us to take risks and actually make bold moves like this that in the end will not only benefit you and give you a happier life, but will benefit humanity and will even benefit the economy financially. Mm -hmm. How did your parents react? Um, you know, they were a little concerned because I told them before I announced it. And so, uh, like all my uh, friends and family, they were a little concerned about how it would impact me and worried about my lifestyle mm -hmm. and financial safety and all those types of things. But I think once we talked about it, they really understood it. And they taught me to live my life based on values and not based on greed or just trying to make money. So I think they were pretty proud. And what was the sequence of the announcement uh, to your employees, the news kind of getting out there, suddenly everybody wants to hear about it or, or wants a piece of you. What was that all like? Well, I'll take a step, one step back from that. So 15 days before I made the announcement is when I decided. And then immediately I start working through financial models. What if there's another recession? Mm -hmm. What if there's a, a huge financial crisis? Start working through all that. And every night I can't sleep and I wake up and I think, forget this stupid idea. Like everything's <laughs> fine, you have it made. Just forget about the idea. But I just, I know I have to do it. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so as much as I want to do this for my own reasons, I have to make it pencil out. Mm -hmm. And I think 90% of it will be paid for by people performing better mm -hmm. when they're more healthy and are more taken care of. But I want to pay for 10% of it with media coverage. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm honest about that, right? And so I had a friend that I stayed with in New York. But how does media coverage translate into paying for it? Well, so it does help in terms of generating awareness of the values and the difference of the type of company we are mm -hmm. versus the other companies. Just picking up new clients or new business? Yeah, picking up new business and also reinforcing for our existing clients that mm -hmm. they're proud of the company that they're doing business with. Raising their rates? No, definitely not. <laughs> I just mean, what is the financial translation from media coverage? If, if you're thinking about it that specifically, like this will be 10% of well, that $2 million. To me, business comes down to three things. And I, I have a completely different philosophy on this than most people. I think the most important thing in business is keeping your clients. Mm -hmm. I think the second most important thing in business is doing more for your clients 
today than you did yesterday and doing more tomorrow than you did today. You're always gonna have an improving or a worsening relationship with all your clients. And so you, you can't really take them for granted. So we wanna push the boundaries. We wanna not raise the rates, but charge less. Mm -hmm. We wanna not cut back on our services or our staff, but do more. And to me, the third and distant third most important thing to do is to get new clients. Mm -hmm. Most businesses reprioritize yeah. those in the opposite direction. So for us, client retention is our number one metric that we live and die off mm. of. That having been said, um, to get back into kind of the media coverage, so I had a friend that I had stayed with in New York um, that worked at the New York Times. Mm -hmm. So he introduced me to a writer at the New York Times. And then our local Seattle NBC affiliate a uh, reporter had actually been promoted to NBC News. Hmm. So we made, a lot of people ask, who is your PR firm? Because right, it right. blew up. But we said, we made two phone calls. We didn't have any PR firm. And so uh, these two folks covered it. And within an hour of the announcement, the New York Times story was live. Wow. Within an hour of the New York Times story being live, it was number one on Hacker News. Wow. An hour later, it was number one on Reddit. And two hours later, it was number one on Facebook, NewYorkTimes.com and Twitter, wow. number one trending. And it stayed there for roughly 48 hours. And this was before there was any television coverage? It, or this it was, was. That was, okay. And so um, I get a call and they say, hey, uh, you need to get on a plane to New York because Matt Lauer wants to interview <laughs> you in the morning. And Good Morning America had reached out and it was really tough because we didn't really want to say no to either one of them, but it's hard to do those two shows the same day live. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but what ended up happening was the story was so big that all three broadcast uh, evening shows covered us wow. after the announcement. And then the next morning, all three broadcast morning shows covered us. Wow. And so it was really crazy. But the part that was even crazier was I was hearing from people, hey, Dan, uh, my mom in Hong Kong mm -hmm thinks you're amazing, <laughs> or uh, you know, India, China, um, Italy, all over the world, South America, everyone from Brazil. You know, this, this story went everywhere. And I actually had a friend, he was like, you know what, Dan, I think it's really cool what you did, but there's lots of cool stuff happening in Brazil. So why did they want to talk about you? <laughs> <laughs> they probably wanted a distraction, <laughs> yeah. knowing uh, Brazil lately. So one of the things that, and I'm, this might be a question that comes up as well, but you know, if the, if the idea is you want to maximize the well-being of your employees, you are taking a risk by essentially wiping out your profits to give them a raise. You know, the business has to be viable long term in order for them to continue to earn what they are, to continue to be employed, etc. Yeah. So when you were thinking through this, and even now after it's happened, you know, going back to your principles about how you run the business, are, do you have 100% confidence you're going to retain all your clients and maybe even down the line grow the business? You know, the long-term success is going to be predicated on being able to keep paying for these employees, maybe even increase that over the time. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we want to continue to push the boundaries. First and foremost, we're dedicated to making credit card processing fair for businesses. That's our number one mission. It's not to pay people the most that we possibly can. You know, that's a strategy that helps us with that first mission. But what I had to ask myself is, obviously you can never do everything perfectly. There are constraints, and you have to have trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And am I a stronger company today with people who I'm not actively hurting their well-being and not actively hurting their performance, or am I a stronger company with a higher profit margin? Mm -hmm. I determined the former was true, but I'm a big underdog there because mm -hmm. it's a lot less tested, it's a lot mm -hmm. less proven, it's a lot less conventional. And I actually think that that's one of the things I'm proud of is I want to live in an economy and a country where we're all willing to stand out and be unconventional and do what we think is mm -hmm. right. And if we end up failing, which I'm 100% determined that that will not happen, mm -hmm. um, at least we tried to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And if we always said, well, I'm just going to do everything the way everybody else mm -hmm. does it, how are you really helping people? How are you really changing the game, changing the conversation? Mm -hmm. When you, how did you announce it to employees? So that part was really fun. Um, I, uh, I, I talked to my senior management team and, uh, you know, kind of, they were all shocked and um, talked to them one-on-one, -on -one, got their concerns, had a lot of follow-up meetings. And finally, when the last person says, I think you're crazy, but I'll support you, mm -hmm. um, we had our quarterly meeting and so we had everybody there. Which is how room. many people? Uh, like 120 people. Okay. 
some joining via satellite, but most there in person. And I started to announce it. And after I did, it was just like stunned silence. <laughs> And I wasn't sure like what was going on, so I actually announced it again. <laughs> and then again, they just sat there in stunned silence. And literally, probably like seven, eight seconds goes by of just dead silence, which felt like an eternity. And I was getting ready to announce it again. <laughs> and then uh, Garrett Nelson, who works at Gravity, he's in sales in our Boise office, but he was in town for the meeting. He just started screaming. <laughs> And then everyone started screaming. And then I'm finally like, oh, this is like people actually like understood and they're happy about it. So I'm so happy, <laughs> smiling, and we just go around and give a bunch of high fives and then have a big party. And so it's been 10 weeks. I'm eager to find out what's happened since. You know, um, we've been working really hard. I think uh, one of the things that I didn't expect, I didn't, of course, I didn't expect all the attention when I announced it. Um, and, and, and we as a company didn't. But it's actually inspired us because we think that um, st stepping out like this, we have a chance to show that you can be unique and creative and lead and actually succeed. And so we know there's a lot of eyeballs. So the overwhelming sentiment at the company is, yeah, I might be doing better in terms of what I'm being paid, but also there's a huge responsibility to make sure this works together. And um, that's been really fun and exciting. And the performance of the last 10 weeks, even though it's still early, mm -hmm. while it's been challenging, it's been very, very positive. And you also had um, some nice reaction from a group of school kids who had written you guys a letter, was it? Yeah, so I got thousands of letters, um, electronic, but actually quite a few in snail mail too. And so uh, they kind of got lost in the shuffle because I was just being overwhelmed. So after a couple weeks, I got these letters and it was 33 uh, sixth graders from Irvine, California, and Hillary Dimitrik, their teacher. And uh, Hillary wrote me this letter and said, I taught my kids that when you do the right thing, even if it's small, you can actually change the world. And you prove that to us. <laughs> and even though there's a lot of people criticizing what you did, I want you to know that all these kids believe in what you did and agree with what you did. And then she reached out to me maybe like a week later on Facebook and said, hey, Bozo, uh, can you please respond to our letters? <laughs> like these kids really look up to you. <laughs> and so I responded back and I said, Miss Dimitrik, your letters touched me so much and I promise I'll respond before the school year gets out. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I did was called the principal. Mm -hmm. And I arranged to have them all set up and I arranged with the principal and a few other administrators at the school. And, and they were in the middle of a grammar lesson. And I came in the back door of the classroom, walked in a few steps, and said, hi, Miss Dimitrik, I'm Dan Price. And the kids went, oh! <laughs> it wasn't so much like excitement, it's just like fear and like shock. <laughs> he seemed to be having this effect on people. <laughs> yeah, it was a very similar effect. And it was such a special experience. These kids. They ask such great questions. And I kid you not, an 11-year-old sixth grader said, I hope other CEOs are inspired what, mm -hmm. by what you did and try to care for their people just as much. Um, you know, and it was just so cool to see how they got it. Mm -hmm. The other thing I noticed when I was doing so much in media, the junior producers and the people booking me, the people walking me in, they really connected with me. They really connected with the story. And I really enjoyed all the you know, top tier media talent mm -hmm. that I was working with. But it was amazing to see the way the cameramen would connect and interact with me compared to the celebrities. Well, the salary probably makes a difference. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, Hoda from today's show, she was trying to keep everybody away from me. <laughs> She's like, no one that works here can talk to Dan. Stay away from him. And, and Natalie Morales actually gave me her resume. <laughs> I think Natalie maybe makes more than 70, but I'm not sure. Maybe. I don't know. It's not a very big show. Um, <laughs> So one of the interesting things uh, lately is that, you know, I, I, what I love again is that what you're doing reflects the success you've had as a company and your own personal views and the economy, the, the whole climate kind of getting better. Um, there's also been a move by the Obama administration to do some things to kind of push businesses uh, to increase minimum wage and to pay more overtime. 
Um, do you support, I mean, I know obviously you support trying to, to pay people more, but your own story, it, it's been such a process. You know, I mean, call it 15 years of getting to this point and now being able to kind of turn around and pay it forward. Yeah. That's a big difference as opposed to having rules set from the get-go um, that you might have to grapple with when you're starting and growing the business. So how do you feel about some of the, cha the top-down changes that we're seeing? Abrupt changes in regulation have a huge cost on business. Um, there's also a huge benefit, sometimes to business, sometimes to society. And what that means to me is it's not ideal, right? Because if you could find a way to get that benefit without the cost, you're gonna be much better off. So for me, having $15 an hour minimum wage like we have in Seattle was a little bit of an indictment on us as business leaders to mm. not step up and lead. Mm -hmm. And so it became necessary and a lot of little businesses were harmed by that change. Mm -hmm. And I felt bad because there's a lot of very successful businesses in Seattle, tech businesses, et cetera, that could have afforded to do more, but didn't. And as a result, there was a rule that got imposed on everybody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that minimum wage got way out of whack by not being indexed. And so right now it's historically low. Mm -hmm. And so people are trying to solve it all at once. Mm -hmm. And it might be necessary, but it sure is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And it sure could hurt some businesses. And I'd love to see a society where we're all trying to contribute to solve that problem. Right. And we're not just waiting for an outside entity to do it. That's exactly what I was going to ask. I mean, given your sort of creative brain behind this, are there, I mean, is there any way to incentivize businesses more um, you know, because it truly just seems to rely on the heart or maybe on enough peer pressure that, you know, or maybe on enough competition for talent where if there are enough guys like you out there, everybody has to start paying wages that rise up to that level. Otherwise, how, you know, regulation is such a, a broad, blunt instrument. It seems like it could never be the one to properly adjudicate the right amount. Well, so theoretically, CEO salaries and average worker salaries are set in the same way, which is you kind of compare and see what, what are other people paying. But the difference is with CEO salaries, there's a big leadership mentality, which is we want our CEO to be the best paid CEO. And so one CEO gets paid more. You think the board boards think that or who thinks that? The CEO themselves or the employees even? A combination, mm -hmm. uh, more the boards than the CEO. Mm -hmm. And so then the other CEOs look and say, well, that's now the new comparison, so we need to come up. And then the, another person wants to be above that, and then there's, that's the new comparison, so now we need to come up. Mm -hmm. Versus average worker salaries, there's no one really driving and leading in that. And so when one company or 10 companies or 1,000 companies actually step up and take a leadership mm -hmm. position, it actually economically has the ability to reset the mm -hmm. standard for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that those companies that lead aren't harmed by paying more in the interim. Mm -hmm. I think they're really... Uh, helped by, by stepping out and leading. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just a matter of us recognizing that it's an issue, leading in that issue. And for me, I wanted to solve it just for our 120 people at Gravity. And the fact that now there's been thousands, if not tens of thousands of people that have received raises because of my small act in a small company. Have they? You've, you've noticed the domino effect. Have people reached out to you and said, we, you did this, so we're doing it too? I got... Uh, uh, a, a, a call from a friend who said, somebody that I know, don't know very well, called me because they know I knew you. Hmm. And she wanted to tell you thank you. And I said, how come? Well, she works at a prudential real estate office, never met her before, never met anyone associated with them. And she walked into work yesterday and her boss gave her a $10,000 raise. Wow. And the boss told her, it's because I realized that the same thing that Dan had been doing unintentionally with his team, mm -hmm. I've been doing with you, and I wanna solve that. And if you look at CEOs of mid-sized companies all over the United States, we're all having this discussion right now. Mm -hmm. And my big goal, which might sound crazy, is income inequality has been racing in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. and we can't fix it overnight. Mm -hmm. But I actually think that if we work together, 2015, or 2016 at the latest, can be the year where the tide turns. Mm -hmm. And it either stops or starts going back. Mm -hmm. And it was racing so fast, it seemed so impossible to stop it, but I actually believe we're gonna stop it this year or next year. And it's, it's interesting because just this morning, the jobs report came out for last month, and 
It was encouraging on the surface. I think we had 223,000 jobs. There were some downward revisions to prior months, but still, like, we'll take it. I remember five years ago when all these economists were saying, we're never going to have more than 100,000 jobs growing a month again. So, you know, good steps. But at the same time, the wage number was really weak. So average hourly earnings, which isn't all encompassing, but it's been running up only about 2% year on year for a while now. And then finally, last month, there were some signs of life, and it jumped, and it was up 2.3%. Everyone was freaking out because they're like, this is amazing. You know, wage inflation, it's here, and all this stuff. And then so to, this morning's report was kind of a disappointment. Um, and I'm just thinking through a lot of what you're saying, and you can almost see it happening out there. That people are going to start taking these steps, but then you get hit in the face with the aggregate number again, which shows it's just not going anywhere. I think what we have today is we have a few early adopters that got a little bump, and then the early adopters already did their thing, so they didn't get to do the second bump. But I think there's a wave that's coming, and we have a little bit of a lull, and this next wave's gonna come. And again, I'm not one to say we're gonna be able to solve this issue in a year or two, but just turning the tide, I think, would be so incredible. Yeah, and I wanna open it up for questions soon in a second here as well. Um, but I am wondering what else you have up your sleeve. Uh, a lot of things, but most of them are just driven to help independent businesses. I mean, that's what we're most passionate about. And so um, recently we developed a program where actually independent businesses can uh, have a deeper relationship with their customers. If their customers want, the independent business can see how often you come in and give you deals and recognize you and just have is a more intimate relationship. Is that through iPhone technology? Uh, a lot of it is through smartphones, but a lot of it is actually through, with people's permission, tracking mm -hmm. their credit cards mm -hmm. when they come into the store. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that we've done that we don't talk about a lot, we have about 12,000 clients. And for our top 500 clients, they've really had a hard time getting financing. Mm -hmm. So we've set aside millions of dollars of profits to finance them. And we've actually um, financed uh, $35 million dollars for these 500 businesses. This is so interesting. So we interviewed the CEO of Wells Fargo a couple of weeks ago on the show, John Stump. Um, they're huge. They're probably ag in, in aggregate the number one small business lender in the country. And he was lamenting the fact that business formation, despite all that we hear about the startups today, is actually weak by historical standards, which is right. true. Yeah. And he said, there's just, the, you know, Kelly, the demand just isn't there. And then I hear your story and it's like, well, it sounds to me like all these businesses are saying the capital's just not there. So which is it? It's a little bit of both, but on the capital's not their side, for a business that wants $150,000, it doesn't really make sense for the bank to go through all the regulation and paperwork to lend $150,000 because they're not going to make that much money. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for the business to jump through all those hoops, you know, get a CPA to do reviewed financials, all those mm -hmm. types of things to get that amount of money. So there's, I think there's a little bit of a hole in the market, which we're filling. Credit cards go up to thirty, fifty, maybe sixty thousand right. dollars, and bank loans start to make sense at maybe a quarter million to a half million dollars, mm -hmm. and a lot of independent businesses need an amount in between there mm -hmm. where they can add another location, they can remodel, they can do things that will really expand their sales. How much does that put you guys at risk as a business, though? Because now you're talking about maybe needing to hold capital against loss, evaluating these businesses to make sure that they are going to be able to pay the loan back, seeing what the competitive rate is, which we know is pretty low these days. Part of the magic of Gravity Payments is our capital structure. We don't have any outside investors. We've never taken outside money. And we also don't really have any debt. And so it allows us to kind of be risky with some of these things and go out on a limb mm -hmm. because we're not beholden to a bank that's going to pull our line of credit. And if I look at my competitors, they're typically borrowing three to seven times their annual earnings wow. to finance their businesses. And so the fact that we don't do that puts us in this enviable position where we actually can believe in our clients, take a risk and help them. And how big is that business now? How fast is it growing for you guys? You know, uh, it's, it's definitely growing like close to 50% a year. Wow. Yeah. So interesting. Um, questions, please. I know there's a microphone floating around and we have one just down in the front here. We'll start here. If you don't mind just saying who you are so we can all hear and then state your question. Thanks a lot. Hi, my name is Kristen D'Alessio. Hey, Kristen. And I love what you did. Thank you. Um, but I wanted to ask, how are you going to measure over the next year productivity? Because... Um, those 120 employees are not going to have a monolithic singular response. Joe is going to be different than Mary. Yep. So after the novelty of it, let's say a few months down the line, wears off, how is that? How are you going to look at that? How are you going to measure yeah, that? Great question. It's going to be interesting to see. 
I think it's an excellent question. Uh, the novelty of it and any buzz that we get really is not sustainable because it's like 15 minutes of fame or 15 minutes of happiness. I think the sustainable part is to actually have a healthier, happier workforce. And while you're, you're right that we can't really expect everybody will react in the same way, I think when we look at our team performance and our team production, that's what will tell us if it worked or not. Now, I just believe in it for non-economic reasons, but if I'm gonna look at it purely economically, if our profit recovers close to where it was before in the next two or three years, then this is gonna be a huge success because we basically were able to do this amazing thing and have it not really cost us anything in the long term. If for some reason, and this is very unlikely, our profit doubles, triples, or quadruples in the next three to five years, I think we might set the world on fire. <laughs> uh, question right here in the middle, please. Hi, I'm Judy Samuelson, and I actually run the Business and Society program here at the Institute, and I have not had this much fun in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. So thank you so much for being here. So uh, a comment and a question. I think what you, it is so powerful what you've done, and one of the reasons it's so powerful is by, by taking the minimum wage yourself. There are a number of CEOs that in a transition period have taken a dollar. But by connecting, you have artfully connected this question of inequality, you know, the top and the bottom end. And that is a very difficult conversation to have in our society. We want to address the bottom, but we're not quite sure how to bring in the top. So my question for you is the following. One of the issues with CEO pay today is how much executives are being paid in stock. So if they are a public company, their focus is on the stock price. Today, maybe next year, not 10 years from now, not 20 years from now. It's a, it's a, it's a very difficult thing. We've got this mantra, pay for performance, et cetera, et cetera. It's a hard question to even get on the table. And I'm kind of curious if you've given thought to that. Absolutely. In terms of good. Okay. Thank you so much for your question, Judy. So I think emblematic of that question is our share buybacks. So share buybacks is where a company says, I have a bunch of money, and instead of paying my team more, instead of investing in our future, we're gonna cash out existing shareholders and the reason why the CEO is incentivized to do that is he's, he's incentivized based on stock price, which comes from earnings per share. And so by having fewer shares outstanding, he gets more compensation. The problem with that is when you take money and you're just trying to manipulate how many shares are out there and manipulate the stock price, it's actually a much easier way for the CEO to hit that huge bonus and get all that stock compensation compared to actually finding a brilliant business idea, which is much harder to execute. And that's just one example. But I think um, the incentive structure is just so hard, and I'm not an economist, I'm not an expert on that. It's really hard for me to say. But what I, I know what would work well, which is if we could come up with a structure that incentivized long-term thinking and also incentivized making a difference. And I know that sounds like a pipe dream to do both those two things because people way smarter than me have been trying to figure out how to do that and, and haven't been able to figure it out yet. Um, I don't think that it's a matter of companies are being shorted because profits are at an all-time high, performance is, is, is at an all-time high. Um, I think it's just the way all this kind of stacked up. And I actually don't think there are very many bad people out there that have intentionally structured it this way. But I do think that not enough people have been willing to say, I'm gonna stand up and sacrifice myself to stand up to this system. So while there are good people out there, we all need to work together to inspire them to do some crazy stuff like what I did. A question right here. Uh, yeah, right, sounds thank good, thanks Judy. Good morning, my name is Sean McIntosh. And I just want to say, Mr. Price, what an inspiration. You know, Thanks, Sean. Call me down. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hello, Kelly. How are you doing? So I, earlier in the conversation, I think both you and Kelly uh, alluded to some of, the, some of the realities as you were thinking about this, this magic number, the sleepless nights on what, what would happen. Basically, how, how do you deal with some of the realities in business given your purpose-driven goals? For example, you know, with you know, the, the economic models say that if you raise... Mm -hmm. 
if you raise minimum wage, you're creating this disparity between a supply and a labor market and the demand that the employers want. So there's a potential for for uh, creating unemployment. How, how do you deal with matters like that, especially with the potentials that you might face in laying off people at your company? Yeah, thank you. Well, I would love it, love it, love it, love it if somebody stepped up tomorrow and said, I'm gonna do an $80,000 minimum wage. I think that would be incredible. Um, the key point here is that we all do the most we can. And, and you do have to be practical. Keep in mind, I started my story by telling you all that I paid my first person $24,000 a year with no benefits. Like, that's pretty darn bad, right? But I was trying to figure out what can I do because I couldn't pay well at the time. And, and so now the, the fact that I could afford to do it and I could do it without cutting against our mission, which is to help independent businesses, and actually I thought that mission would benefit from the decision, it, to me, it, it was worth it, but we're, very more, we're, we're way more sensitive when we take risks to whatever we lose in the risk than whatever we gain. Mm -hmm. And so any decision you make, anything you do with your life, you're going to get something out of it, and it's going to cost you something. And the reason why we're so risk averse is if it costs us 10 cents and it makes us a dollar, we just think about that 10 cents that it costs us. So we actually need to just be bold and be willing to make mistakes and when we all do different things, our economy is actually stronger. When we all do the same thing, we're much more vulnerable. Very well put. Uh, let's switch it up. How about we're right back there? Hi, Dan. My name is Heather McGee. I'm the president of a public policy organization called Demos that has actually been working, doing research and communications around this exact issue for the past three years. Um, we have a project called Retail's Hidden Potential, where we've been making the argument that higher wages, uh, particularly for low-paid workers, would be a win-win-win for the workers themselves, for the businesses in, in higher productivity, and also for the economy overall. And we also did that work looking at the epidemic of share buybacks and finding that, for example, our biggest private employer, Walmart, could have uh, actually paid its workers $5 more an hour with the amount that it spent on share buybacks. So as you can imagine, when your announcement came in the New York Times, it was really big. It went around our office and we were all very excited. So I want to give you just a real softball question that I hope will um, be good for everyone in the room, which is, you have done so much to show in practice what all of the economists on my staff have been arguing through white papers would be good for the economy. And you've done it in a town in Seattle where there's also been that upward pressure on wages. You've done a lot. What can each of us do to help you? Because you're actually, you took that leading edge step. And I think it's really important for all of us here who are inspired to be able to walk away feeling like they can do something to help build this movement you're talking about. Well, thanks a lot, Heather. Um, I know about you enough to know uh, you're already doing a lot, too, and uh, we're definitely um, on the same team in a lot of things. Um, I think what we can do is, is just lead. And to me, the way that you can lead is developing that self-awareness about what drives you that I talked about earlier, thinking about what's the one thing that if you could accomplish this one thing, you'd be willing to give up everything else in your career. Connecting to that and, and going to work every day and just deciding I'm going to live based on values, I'm going to lead, I'm not going to do it the same way as everybody else just because they did it. I'm going to find my own unique way. The other thing that might surprise you is um, whether you're a CEO or an entry-level person, you can really inspire others. The people that inspire me every day are the frontline folks that work with our clients. And so you can actually be a source of inspiration. There were, there, the, the majority of people at Gravity never said a single word of complaint or suggestion prior to the announcement. And I'm not suggesting you don't complain because I think complaining is a really positive thing. <laughs> but there are more than one way to inspire other people. And so a big way that I was inspired was just seeing people that were so driven, that were so connected to our mission, to their mission, and, and so I think there's something poetic about doing it that way. I think also sometimes you need to stick up for yourself and negotiate and be honest the way Jason was. But, you know, we're all different. We're all different personalities. And so each of us needs to find that unique way that we can lead and take steps forward. And then, um, of course, if there's any businesses out there, 
you know, that use gravity payments, continuing to do that and helping us out really, <laughs> um, really makes my life a lot easier. Uh, yes, down here in the yellow, just one second. Microphone is, it's a microphone race, so she's gonna win. There we go. We should have put a bet on. <laughs> Thank you, I'm Larry Summers. Uh, not. Um, my name is Reub <laughs> Reub Reuben Schilling. <laughs> You know, you know, I, I talked to Larry Summers last night. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. The yeah, we listened to him this giveaway. morning. No, no, can I, t I, I want to hear your, your question, but I actually talked to Larry Summers last night. I was like, oh, hey, you know, Dr. Summers, really excited to meet you. Been reading about you forever and following you and, you know, kind of explained to him. And I kind of told, I told him what I did and tried to see if he was excited about it. I think he kind of shrugged his shoulders like, yeah, that's cute. And then he went and talked to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds about right. <laughs> Dr. Summers? In any case, uh, yesterday afternoon we listened to Senator Ryan uh, talk about the, or mention these welfare mothers who are taking advantage of the, the, the welfare system out there. And um, I'm just wondering how your, your philosophy uh, is connected to your personal view of human nature. Can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit, that last part? Yeah, well, uh, th there is kind of a narrative, you know, uh, on one side of politics in, in the U.S. that uh, we have these lazy, no for good, yeah. good for nothing uh, I got it. people that take advantage of yep. the, the system. Okay, so Rush Limbaugh, after I made my announcement, came out. And I actually grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh. My mom's a big fan of his, and I'm a big fan of my mom, so... <laughs> Distributive property? Yeah. So, so, um, so I, I, I heard Rush Limbaugh after our announcement, and he said that he was hoping and thinking that one day we would be a case study for how to ruin a company, how to send people into poverty, how to make people dependent on others, and particularly government. And, um, and he hoped all these things would happen. And, and he explained how Human nature is such that when you give somebody something, they, then the next time they expect more, and then the next time they expect more, and it's basically a losing battle. You can never get ahead. And a lot of people were expecting me to come out and disagree with Rush, but I actually said, I agree with Rush. He's right to a certain level about human nature, and I'm right to a certain degree about human nature. I believe that the more you do for people, the more you trust them, the more they give it back to you and you create this, you know, I mean, for lack of a better word, love <laughs> and that you feel and you do more and you help each other out. And I don't think Rush is wrong and I don't think I'm wrong, right? And so they're contradictory. And my thought is I want to appeal to this part of human nature, which definitely exists. And I'm going to let Rush appeal to his part of human nature. And I presume you don't want to be the cautionary example. Well, you know, to me, I actually thought there was a lot of value in listening to what he had to say and respecting it because we are underdogs mm -hmm. and it's going to come down to execution. Mm -hmm. This idea is not such an amazing idea that it'll run itself. Mm -hmm. It's going to be up to all of us to make it work and, and really lead the way in that manner. Fair enough. Time for one or two more. Sure, right here. Oh, and then, sorry, back there as well, uh, right afterwards, here first. Yes, thanks. I'm Erin Foster. I work for an HR, or work for a robotics company in HR, so cool. I'm fascinated by this idea, thinking of how it would go Wait, across. a robotics company has HR? Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. Erin, <laughs> are you a cyborg? <laughs> I am, actually, yes. It's a really good example. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I was thinking similar to Ruben, actually, is his name, um, his question earlier, and the type of culture that you have to have in a company to keep this type of idea going. Because yeah. I think of the um, old timers, if you will, or those that are a little more traditional are thinking that you need to pay your dues in order to get to this type of a spot. And then there's others that are new to the workforce that I think you have to have a certain sense of maturity to understand that um, you do work hard, you need to have a certain work ethic, and you don't just get this because you're entitled to it. So how do you maintain that in your culture? How do you think about that when you're hiring new people? Just curious to get your thoughts. Yeah, yeah Aaron, great question. So I, I again agree um, with the naysayers there, but I think they're like um, a small part of a big pie. 
So they're right, but they're choosing to focus on the 10% and ignoring the 90%. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick somebody who inspired huge devotion in his team, probably not somebody that a lot of people here are a fan of, but Che Guevara. They asked Che Guevara, who's one of the most you know, brutal, depending on your perspective, terrorists of all time, or freedom fighters of all time. He would kill people left and right. They asked Che Guevara, such a brutal person, what's the number one thing that you look for when you're trying to recruit a guerrilla freedom fighter? Anyone know what Che Guevara said? He said love. And if that's true for a war where you're killing people every day, how can it not be true for business as well? And so to me, that's the 90%. And then all this technical stuff, we have to work it out and figure it out, and it's a little messy. I'd rather have it be channeled in what you're, you guys are doing, um, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, back there. Hi, my name's Brad. Um, I'm really fascinated by this notion of your different scorecard. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. I know you've mentioned it several times. And then also, when you bring that different scorecard up with business leaders, does it seem to resonate or do they want to fall back into the more traditional scorecard? Yeah, so when I talk to business leaders, which I spend a lot of time talking to business leaders about this, and when I talk to business leaders, I ask them a pretty simple question. Think about your grandkids and your great-grandkids. Would you rather have them be really well off because they inherited a ton of money because you were a multi-billionaire? Or would you rather have them be well off because they inherited a great society, a great world, and a great economy where you moved the entire platform forward for them to benefit from? Every business leader out there, with very few exceptions, will say that they prefer to actually have a better world. But most business leaders, when they analyze their own action, will admit that it's driven more toward accumulating wealth. And so there's a disconnect between what we as business leaders want and how we act. And, and, and for me, I'm just trying to shine the light on myself on the, on the ways that I'm not meeting that standard and trying to improve it every day. And I think that's what's going to lead us to filling out that scorecard. Now, part of the problem is it's really easy to quantify how much profit do I have and how much money is in the bank. And it's really hard to quantify how much of an impact have I had out there. And we're competitive. We like to keep score. And so we gravitate toward an easy way of keeping score. And I think that maybe somebody in this room, but somebody's going to come up with a step forward and then another step forward, and we will find a way to create that integrity where what we do every day aligns with the things we most care about. We'll leave it there, everybody. Dan, thank you for such a stimulating and enjoying conversation. Thanks for being here.